Hi everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. We're going to continue our discussion of redox reactions by talking about reductive dehalogenation. So this is huge, this is a very important process for environmental people like us because a lot of environmental contaminants are halogenated compounds. Uh, here's just an example of carbon tetrachloride, here's perchloroethylene, uh, here's a PCB molecule, dioxins would also fall under this rubric, DDT is a chlorinated organic, um, all kinds of things are, are halogenated organic compounds that are important as contaminants in the environment. So for almost all chlorinated and brominated compounds, reductive dehalogenation is important. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little tiny bit in the next uh, little sub-lecture about um, perfluoro compounds and how there's some evidence now that even perfluoro compounds can be defluorinated. So reductive dehalogenation is when you add an electron to this chlorinated compound, you spit off the halogen, in this case the chlorine, as a chloride, negatively charged. And in this case, since we're only moving one electron around, we have to have a charge balance. We've got minus one over here, minus one over here, so we can't have any charge here, so this must be a radical. Uh, so this is the trichloromethyl radical. So this process where you accept the electron and you immediately kick out the chloride is called a dissociative process and it forms radicals, okay? So it's dissociative because the instant that you transfer the electron, the carbon-chlorine bond gets broken. For aromatics, there's some evidence that you, uh, you transfer the electron and then you form this thing which is a, a radical, but it hasn't lost its chlorine yet, so it's a negatively charged radical. Uh, and this exists for some tiny, tiny fraction of a second, and then you spit out the chloride and you end up with your radical as your product. So this is what we would call non-dissociative, because that carbon-chlorine bond doesn't break immediately upon transfer. So in between the two, these are aliphatic, carbons up here, right? This is aliphatic carbon and these are aromatic carbons. In between are the vinyl carbons and we're not really sure but we think it's probably a dissociative mechanism for the vinyl halides where you transfer the electron and immediately you spit out the chloride. So uh, we can look at the one electron reduction potentials and we see across the board they're not particularly favorable except for here's carbon tetrachloride which is quite quite favorable. So that, that likes to be reduced. Here's hexachloroethane, it's quite favorable. Uh, but even the perchloroethylene, it's not that favorable. So, uh, but the take home message here is that the more halogens you have on the molecule, the more favorable your redox potential is. So this is a range with redox potentials increasing as you go down the column and therefore the number of halogens. So here we've got uh, chloromethane with only one chlorine and then we have um, somewhere down here we have dichloromethane and we have trichloromethane and then we have carbon tetrachloride and the redox potential gets more favorable when you increase the number of chlorines same thing here for the chlorinated ethylenes and also for the chlorinated uh, excuse me these are the chlorinated ethanes chlorinated ethanes and here are the chlorinated ethylenes and for in all cases it's true that the redox potential gets more favorable as you increase the number of halogens on the molecule uh, so there's three main mechanisms. Uh, really, these two are the two most important. This one, a eh, little bit, not so much. So hydrogenolysis is where you react the chemical. So say this is an aliphatic chloride, two electrons, add a proton. You replace the chlorine or the halogen with a hydrogen and you kick out the chloride. So that's because you're replacing something with hydrogen, that's why it's called hydrogenolysis. Not to be confused with hydrolysis. This is hydrogenolysis. And then you have reductive elimination and the beta means that like this is the alpha carbon, alpha. It's a very bad alpha, there's alpha. And this is the beta carbon. Uh, so you have chlorine, sorry, this is, this is the beta carbon. So you have chlorines on, one on the alpha carbon, one on the beta carbon. If you add two electrons here, you can form the double bond and kick out two chlorine, chlorines, chlorides. So here you need two electrons just to get rid of one chloride. Here, for two, the price of two electrons, you get rid of two chlorines. So that's sort of favorable from our point of view, like we like that, we wanna get rid of the chlorine because generally speaking, if you can get rid of the chlorine, you can make the compound less toxic. Uh, 
And it turns out that this reaction is also, not only is it favorable from a, you know, an environmental standpoint, but it's also favorable thermodynamically because these two chlorines are heavily solvated. They have a very low delta G of formation, very negative delta G of formation. So the fact that you produce two of them makes this reaction quite thermodynamically favorable, especially relative to this reaction. So when a chemical can undergo beta elimination, it usually will. And it turns out that this happens even if you have a double bond here. So this would be uh, either probably most likely trans dichloroethylene. You add two electrons and you get this thing, which is acetylene, like an acetylene torch. It's acetylene. And you've, you've kicked out two chlorides. So you could even have double bonds being converted to triple bonds. You can also have something called reductive alpha elimination, which is where both of the chlorines are on the same carbon, the alpha carbon. Okay. And so you can kick out two chlorines here and you get this very odd thing where carbon only has two bonds to it. Uh, two bonds, one, one to the first chlorine and a second bond to the second chlorine. And there's actually a lone pair of electrons here. Let's see if I can draw them, not very well. But there's a lone pair of electrons. And this thing, this odd funky thing, is called a carbene. Yeah, it's, it's weird. You don't see it very often, but it is possible. These things do form, and there's evidence that they can form even in water, uh, although they will react with the water pretty quickly. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that can happen. Again, hydrogenolysis and reductive beta elimination are the two most common. Uh, in some weird cases where, where you have the chlorinated methanes, you can get reductive alpha elimination. Uh, so in groundwater, one of the most common contaminants is our friend PCE. This is the Full Employment Act for Environmental Scientists. A lot of people make their living trying to help uh, all these different sites that have contamination with PCE. So it's worth spending a few minutes talking about the reductive dechlorination of PCE. Uh, this is from my, my buddy, Bill Arnold, who is now a professor at the University of Minnesota. He was, uh, was a graduate student with me at Johns Hopkins back in the 90s when we were young, like you. <laughs> and now we're old. Um, so this is something that he did for his dissertation. So you see, okay, PCE can be reduced by hydrogenolysis, where you remove this chlorine and replace it by a hydrogen, and that hydrogenolysis would make TCE. But it could also be reduced by that reductive beta elimination, which would give you convert the double bond to a triple bond and you get this thing called dichloroacetylene. Dichloroacetylene could undergo a hydrogenolysis step to become chloroacetylene and maybe even another hydrogenolysis step to become acetylene. When you hit acetylene, all the chlorines are gone and the compound is just now much, much less toxic. And bacteria know what to do with acetylene and they will convert it to ethylene pretty quickly and then ethylene to ethane and they'll just eat it. So this is a favorable pathway. If we could get the reaction to go this direction, that would be good. That would make us happy. Uh, again, the hydrogenolysis pathway, pathway would say PCE goes to TCE, which goes to one of these dichloroethylene isomers. Uh, and then perhaps that goes down to vinyl chloride, which goes to ethylene. The problem with this is the vinyl chloride. So remember we said that the more chlorines you have, the more favorable the redox potential. And we also said that more favorable redox potentials are associated with faster kinetics of reduction. So PCE gets reduced to TCE pretty rapidly. So this step is pretty rapid. This step is not too bad. Uh, and then frequently, if you're studying you know, groundwater that's contaminated with PCE or TCE, what you see is you see lots and lots of cis DCE. This is the characteristic product of microbial degradation of PCE and TCE. You see lots of cis, and then some of it might get converted to vinyl chloride, but it gets slower and slower, right? So this is now getting really slow, and this is almost, almost not happening at all. So sometimes you get stuck at vinyl chloride, and vinyl chloride is the most toxic of all these things that you see on screen. So you really want to try to avoid getting stuck at vinyl chloride. So a lot of research projects are involved in how, how can I get the, what, the vinyl chloride that's being produced in my system to go to ethylene. Uh, and there's various ways to do that. Generally speaking, if you can drive the redox potential to become more and more reducing, so i.e. drive it all the way to methanogenesis, then you could get this final step to go. Uh, otherwise, sometimes, like I said, you get stuck at vinyl chloride and that's not a happy outcome. 
So in the, the typical groundwater, you see this step is quite favorable. Uh, you see this step where, again, the cis isomer, the cis isomer is the one that is sort of the main product of microbial dehalogenation. Um, then sometimes you see vinyl chloride, and if you're really lucky, you can get things to go to ethylene. So this pathway in, that I've shown in red here is the one that occurs for microbes, okay? Now, again, this acetylene pathway would be really favorable if you could get it to go, but microbes don't seem to be able to do this. So in order to get this pathway to go, you frequently have to use an abiotic reactant, some abiotic source. So in this example, you know, he's, he's looking at zinc as a possibility, and he's saying it might be true for other abiotic reactants like vitamin B12, which is an iron porphyrin, it's actually a cobalt porphyrin, uh, iron zero, which is, you know, metallic iron, this is metallic zinc. So these would all be good electron donors because zinc can donate two electrons to become zinc two. Iron zero can donate three electrons to become iron three. So these are strong reductants. And if you use a really strong chemical reductant, you might be able to get the reaction to go via this pathway, which circumvents the production of vinyl chloride. You don't have to worry about the vinyl chloride. You're not going to form it if you can go via this pathway. Uh, so here's our uh, redox potentials. I wrote a whole chapter of my dissertation on redox, calculating all of these redox potentials. So I calculated the redox potential for the hydrogenolysis reaction and also for the elimination reaction. So this is E2H for hydrogenolysis and E2E for elimination. And you see that wherever you have the ability, sorry, that's not very good, wherever you have the ability to undergo uh, both hydrogenolysis and elimination, you see that the elimination is more favorable. Okay, again here, 0 0.6, 0 0.467 versus 0.735, elimination is more favorable. 0.52 versus 0.8, elimination is more favorable. 0.58 versus 0.96, elimination is favorable. So all of this is happening for, you know, here's, here's, um, this is uh, 1122 tetrachloroethane, could go to either cis or trans. Uh, either way, the elimination is favorable relative to the hydrogenolysis. And then here's your ethenes, ethylenes. The technical name, you know, chemists would call it ethene, but a lot of uh, environmental people still use the word ethylene. It's not technically correct, but people still do it. Uh, so here's PCE, hydrogenolysis. Redux potential is 0.59, but the reductive elimination product to, to dichloroacetylene, 0.62, so that's more favorable. Again, here's uh, trichloroethene, trichloroethylene, sorry, being converted. Here's the hydrogenolysis product. Here's the elimination product. Elimination product is preferred. So you get the point. Uh, a reductive elimination is thermodynamically favorable compared to hydrogenolysis. And so uh, my buddy, Bill Arnold, did some work on this in his dissertation, and he looked at the percent of the reaction that goes via reductive elimination. Uh, this is for reactions with zinc, again, an abiotic reaction. So the percent that goes versus reductive elimination is listed here, and it's plotted versus its redox potential. As the redox potential for elimination gets more favorable, this is the difference between the two. So as the elimination becomes more favorable, more and more of the product is going to go via the elimination pathway. Again, with an abiotic reactant. When bacteria are involved, bacteria just don't seem to be able to do this. Uh, there's linear free energy relationships that we can use to predict the, the uh, kinetics of redox reactions. Remember, we've said that for redox reactions and only for redox reactions, we can frequently uh, make a, a, a relationship between the kinetics and the thermodynamics. So if we can predict kinetics, we can predict thermodynamics, and vice versa. If we can predict thermodynamics, we can predict kinetics. We could use those redox potentials, like the ones that I calculated. Sometimes you can calculate those, and sometimes the data you need to calculate them are not available. Uh, you can use the energy of the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, because when the chemical is reduced, it's taking on electrons. Those have to go somewhere, so they go into that lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So the energy of that LOMO would describe how, how good an electron acceptor it is. Bond dissociation energies, because these are dissociative reactions where you split the chloride off as soon as the electron is transferred. So knowing how strong that bond is and how much energy it takes to break it might help us figure out how fast the reaction goes. And then maybe those two electron reduction potentials, right? E1 is when you get a radical. 
E2 is where you get either the hydrogenolysis product or the elimination product. So those, these are the kinds of things that we might be able to use uh, to predict the rates of redox reactions. So for example, again, here's Bill Arnold. Uh, here's the one electron reduction potential that I calculated. And then here's his measured reaction rate constant. Notice that this is SA for a surface reaction, surface area. So instead of having units of like per molar per second, this is liter per square meter per hour because it's a surface. So it's a little bit of a weird reaction rate constant. Uh, but the vast majority of all of his reactions are falling on this line. There's only one here that doesn't quite seem to fit. That's the reaction of vinyl chloride. For some reason, it just doesn't work. But if you leave that one out, you get a good R squared. So E1, one electron reduction potentials, are a good predictor of reaction rates. And notice, uh, you know, as we become, you know, we get closer to being positive, we get less negative, the reaction goes faster. Right, so that's what we've said, that the more favorable the reaction, the faster it'll go. That makes sense. Here's uh, using E2 instead of E1. That, you know, to use E2, you got to know what the product is. So he had to measure not only the rate at which the parent disappeared, but he also had to measure the rate at which the product was appearing and divide these things up. The same chemical could be forming a hydrogenolysis product and could be forming a reductive elimination product. So we had to measure those separately, but you can see you get good, pretty good relationships, right? Again, here's vinyl chloride, just not making any sense, but everything else seems to be working okay. <coughs> good R squareds, everything makes sense. You know, reactions becoming more favorable thermodynamically and going faster kinetically. So this all makes sense, yay, we're happy. Um, then here's some more examples. This is where I did some work, uh, and this is actually from uh, uh, different Arnold, Robert Arnold, looking at uh, electrolytic reduction of low molecular weight chlorinated compounds, and he used bond dissociation energies here. They're reasonably good. This is not very good. That's not a good R squared, but that's a good R squared. So sometimes BDEs were working well. Uh, here's one electron reduction potentials. Not so great here, but pretty great here. So sometimes they work well, sometimes not so much. Uh, and then here's another example from Bill Arnold. He was using one electron reduction potential. This is a reaction. Now this is the reaction with iron. Before we had reactions with zinc and they were fitting really well. But here's the reaction with iron and it's not making so much sense because first of all, you got two reactions that are not fitting. That didn't fit before and now they're not fitting. Um, but the problem here is that the reaction is becoming thermodynamically more favorable, but the reaction rate constant is going down. Like, what is up with that? That doesn't make any sense at all. So these reactions don't, these, these relationships don't always work. Sometimes they break down. So yes, frequently you can predict the rates of redox reactions by knowing something about their thermodynamics, but sometimes that relationship doesn't work. All right. Catch you on the other side where we'll talk about reductive uh, dechlorination and debromination and defluorination of persistent organic pollutants.